Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Hope everyone is doing well. So time flies like an arrow. We are already, already almost at the last lecture. Uh, mind you that next week, same time, same place, I will give a recollection of topology. So kind of focusing a bit on, on what would be important to know in general and maybe also for the exam. Um, yeah, so today we continue our study of those beasts here. Uh, so knots, and mind you, last time um, we explored this hash symbol again, which is really just the same um, in almost the same in, in knot theory. Essentially, well, what you do is you have two pieces of strings, and you have four endpoints, right? So here's one, two, three, four, and well, there, there are two natural ways to connect them, either like this or like this. And the hash sum is just changing one of them to the other. Right? So you just cut it and reconnect new if you want. And it gives you, gives us a kind of a multiplication on, so hash would go from here to here, gives us a multiplication on knots. And actually that one is pretty good. It, it's really like standard multiplication. You have a prime number factorization. You have prime numbers or prime knots. Um, the prime number factorization is unique. There's no ambiguity anywhere. Um, and then I try to convince you that there are infinitely many primes, prime knots. Um, and that was, well, I, I skipped the proof. That's not so easy because we don't have a good grip right now to kind of distinguish those knots. So here's a table of them going up to, um, up to eight crossings. But right now we don't have any good, really good tools. So they're all different, but we don't have any really good tool. If I would pick out two of them, um, and essentially, that's what I will do in the, in the exam. I pick out randomly two of them, this one and this one, whatever. And I will ask, uh, are they the same? Are they different? Um, yeah, so we would need some methods to do that. And the only one we have seen so far is the color, coloring, the three coloring method. Okay. And we are trying to, well, I'll show you two more methods to do it. Um, yeah, so that was up to now what we have seen. And what we are really lacking is any good way um, to do this. And the easiest knot we haven't, well, we weren't able to uh, distinguish from the unknot is the figure eight knot. So the figure eight knot, as a reminder, uh, is the one with a, with a little eight in the middle. Uh, this is a horrible picture. Uh, so let me try to find it. It's this guy here, right? So the, the trefoil is the one with three crossing. That was fine. We were able to distinguish that with the three coloring. Um, but the other one, we weren't able to do it. So they all have na names, by the way. It's a very tiny. I hope you can see it. So you list them, and then you give them names, just list, uh, just number on, on the list. And the way it works is you just put the number of crossings, let's say four, for this one here, four, and then it's the first one with four crossings. So it's four, one. And then you have, for example, two with five crossings. Uh, the next two here. Uh, 5, 1, and 5, 2, right? The first one was 5 crossings, the second one was 5 crossings, and so on. You don't need to remember the labeling, but just to uh, mention that there is a labeling of those knots. Fine. Okay, so this is for figure 8 was 4, 1. The only knot with 4 crossings, um, and we can't, we can't distinguish it from the other knot. It's very disappointing, so if you just build it out of rope, if I would be a real human being and not just a simulation, I would just pick a rope, I would just bring a rope with me and build it out of rope, and you could convince yourself um, that it's actually not the unknot. But we are looking for a mathematical way of doing it, so it, not taking a rope into your hand. The rope method works, but I guess not many of you will have a rope during the exam, so, so maybe uh, we need some better way of doing it. Your shoelaces might do. Some people might have shoelaces. Um, anyway, still not recommended, so we are trying to do that in a slightly better way. Okay, and what we had we were the three colorings, and the problem is this one is not three colorable. Fine. So maybe um, we want to do this a little bit in the kind of deeper version. So, so here's the three coloring. And, and let's just say, instead of putting colors, I put numbers. Huh? Uh, so I color them with numbers, and I call my numbers 0, 1, and 2. Three coloring, 0, 1, and 2. Kind of makes sense? I call my numbers 0, 1, and 2. Um, what, what, what can we say about 
number one plus number two plus number three. So we have all three of them present, so what can we say about this number? And this is kind of the right question to ask, as we will see. It's not quite obvious, but um, essentially for a mathematician, and coloring, I mean, colors are very nice. We are all uh, visual humans, so we like to, to look at colors. But as a mathematician, then the coloring is the same as labeling it with something. We can just draw numbers and just call the number zero blue and call the number one red and call the number two green or something. Um, so we just put labels on there. And then it also gets much easier because now we can somewhat generalize. You can think of having a trillion labels. Having a trillion colors is a bit more difficult, but having a trillion labels, is, a trillion number labels is not, is not difficult to imagine. And that's what essentially what we are trying to do. Okay, so this was a coloring picture. So what kind of relation holds between numbers instead of colors. I still recommend to think about colors, obviously, but somehow for the mathematical point of view, it, numbers and colors are the same. Mathematicians are weird. Numbers and colors are the same. But you know, uh, a donut is the same as a swim ring anyway. So whatever. OK, so we had those allowed crossings, and we had the disallowed crossing. So the allowed crossing, there's a, the, the, the completely silly one, the monochromatic one. So this, the, the orange one stands for all three possibilities. Blue, I can draw one of them. Maybe I can just draw all of them. The blue one, uh, the red one, and what is my final color? The green one, probably. Okay. And then we have the, the real crossing, so the, the, the nice coloring where all colors are present. And the only ones that are not, dis that are not allowed are whenever two colors are present. Yeah, so like blue, just one strand blue and two, uh, sorry, one strand red and two strands blue, for example. Okay. And let's try the following. So definition, a P coloring, and now I have way more colors, right? I have P of them. P will be a prime soon, but for now it's just some number. A P coloring, zero up to P minus one. P equals three, it's a three coloring. We just put numbers on the, on colors, numbers on the strings, such that this equation holds. And mod P just means they have the same remainder upon division by P. I will do that in a second for you for the three colorings. And we could do the same like the number of P colorings. Well, before it had a little three, now it has a little P, the number of P colorings of our little knot. And we do the same. We call it not P colorable if there is more than the boring coloring. Okay. So there is always a monochromatic coloring because really what, what is then written here is all of these numbers are the same. Right? And two times something equals something plus something is then always true if all of the symbols are the same. So you always have those monochromatic colorings. And they're like boring, we don't want them. So we call something P colorable if, well, there's more than the boring coloring. I'll show you some examples in a second. Okay. Um, this was what I said, so let's just do it here. Let me get rid of my. I have a little space here, so we can do it like here. So let's just do it. So if all of them are the same, for example, all of them are zero. Well, let me just draw it for all of them are zero. Zero, zero, well, maybe zero is too boring. Let's say all of them are one. One, one, one. Then clearly, two times one, the overgoing strand, equals one plus one. There's not much to be said. Similarly, if it wouldn't be one but two or zero, this is always true. A little bit more exciting down here. So let me do use the following color code. Let me uh, just randomly assign numbers here. Let's say this is two. Let's say this is one. And let's just say this is zero. Then down here, I have two times zero. I write it in black. Two times zero equals, because zero is a strand that goes over. That the strand that goes over gets the number two. Okay? Two times zero equals, and then uh, 2 plus 1 mod 3 plus 1 mod 3. And that's exactly right. So 0, here is 0. This is 0, of course. This is 3. They have the same remainder upon division by 3 because they are both divisible by 3. Okay. So that's how it should look like. Let me try one more. Let me just shrink that one, put it somewhere here. And let's try. Um, let's say we do this crossing with green going over 
and blue and red. Okay, this will look as follows. I just now write in black. So green, go, blue goes over. Uh, sorry, green goes over. So it's two times one equals uh, red and whatever. That's two plus zero, and it works out perfectly. Again, so you can take this one, and then there's one more option. Just do it as well. Put it here. There's one more option. Uh, red going over. Red goes over, and whatever. Blue and green. So now my equation reads as uh, 2 times 2, 2 times 2 is equal to uh, 0 plus 1, which is correct because this is 4 mod 3. <laughs> this is 4, this is 1 mod 3, right? So 4 has remained 1 upon division by. Wait. Okay, this is good. So all of our allowed crossings satisfy this condition. So let's have a look at the, one of the non-allowed ones, maybe, maybe this one here. So now our condition would read 2 times 0 equals, well, 0 plus 2. And that's clearly wrong, right? So here, 0 equals 2. That's mod 3. That's, that's not true. So this is, this is bad. Similarly, all the other ones, all the disallowed ones, will not satisfy this equation. So that's the whole trick. And now we can just generalize it. And just say, well, let's go back to the slide. For an arbitrary p, you can just, that's our condition. That's our coloring condition for the strings. Right? I call it the coloring. I say it again, but it's coloring with numbers, which mathematicians like to do all the time. So we color here with numbers. And the numbers are just elements from 0 to p minus 1. Okay. And we call that the p coloring. And otherwise, it's exactly the same as before. Right? Number of p-colorings, p-colorable, uh, using at least two colors. No, nope, that's clear. We have some um, example in a second. So it's really just saying they're divisible by three, right? So, and I just showed you the first, we just did the first uh, bullet point kind of life on the previous slide. And this a priori depends on the choice of the projection, but we will see that it actually does. Okay, so this is a not invariant as well. So for all p, you get a not invariant this way. So that will be the upshot. Um, the monochromatic coloring, I call it a constant coloring here. Uh, so it's always a coloring. Um, I call it the constant coloring now because numbers, but you can call it the monochromatic coloring if you want. So it's always a p coloring, so you always have p of them. Note that I start counting at zero, so I always have p numbers, so I always have p of them. So these numbers are at least uh, whatever, P. Um, so we are interested in the ones uh, where this is a strict inequality, exactly like for the three color. Right? I hope that makes sense. Generalization of the story from before, and now you can take any P. Any number P. Okay. And we will look at those for primes because. The congruence relation is just nice for primes. So the next one would be a five coloring, then the seven coloring, 11 coloring. Uh, you get the point. So you have still infinitely many of those colorings. Cool. So you have an example. And I will do this example in a second for you. We do it live. Um, but keep in mind that I really don't like those monochromatic colorings. I take them for the count. But if I ask, is there a coloring, it, it shouldn't be monochromatic. The monochromatic ones are too boring. I want a coloring of this form. Note that not all colors need to be present, just something that is not monochromatic. OK. Um, OK, I gave it a five coloring. So let's see. Uh, oh, this is an example for p equals five. I should correct that. So a five coloring, not all colors need to be present. So just 0, 1, so 2 is missing. Okay, let's see whether the um, condition is actually um, satisfied. Uh, okay, so this is the, the coloring. We, we do another example in a second. The other example is a bit nicer. Um, okay, suppose that we have a coloring, and then both of these are not invariants. It's exactly the statement. We'll come back to the examples in a second. So we have an infinite number of not invariants, just out of the, out of the blue, from, from 1 to infinite, because we just replaced 3 by an arbitrary number, p. And well, the number of them, or the well, property of being p colorability, p 
being p colorable is a both invariance of the norm. And the proof is exactly the same. I kind of remind you uh, how the proof works. But anyway, um, so remember how the proof worked for, um, do I have it somewhere? Worked for, I do have it, give me a second. This is not the right video. This is not the correct video. This is good, okay. Remember how the proof worked for the three colorings. Here it is. So how do you prove that it's, in, it's a not invariant? Well, you need to check it's invariant under the Rademeister moves. You give everything a fixed color and you check that both sides of the moves have the same uh, number of local colorings. So you can do the same instead of with red, whatever this video uses, red, blue, and yellow, I think. Instead of doing it with red, blue, and yellow, you can just do it with zero up to p minus one. It's exactly the same argument. You just color your strings now with, uh, instead of with, let's do one more. So you color the endpoints uh, on one side, and then you just see that there's one possibility to extend this coloring to the other side. There's exactly one possibility. We can put blue uh, in the middle. Fine, and you can do exactly the same um, with arbitrary numbers. And it, it really is exactly the same, same thing. It's kind, of, it's kind of amazing. As soon as you make this step, um, just saying that the coloring is nothing else than an equation in numbers, you from one, from one point to the other have infinitely many uh, colorings. Uh, sorry, infinitely many not invariants. Just uh, not kind of really uh, nice and amazing. I hope that's clear. It's kind of really the same, right? The interesting idea is to replace a coloring by an equation, and you now can do it for every number. And everything we have seen for three colorings works exactly in the same way for uh, five colorings, seven colorings, whatever type of colorings you want. Yeah, yeah, that one. And you also get this one, for example. We had um, this equation for the hash. So the number of colorings of the hash is one over three times the number of colorings for the other, times the number of colorings of the other ones. And now it's one over p. So just replace, in, in, take the equation from before, replace every three by a p, and uh, the, the, the way how we proved it is exactly the same. You pick some coloring on the left-hand side, and you push it up to a coloring on the right-hand side. It's exactly the same thing. This is a really beautiful example of when slightly making something slightly more abstract, just going from colorings to colorings with numbers to numbers to equations, you can just get so much more, just almost for free. Right? We have now infinitely many not invariants. Okay. The only question that I haven't addressed is, well, is there actually any way of doing this? So I, I tell you about a coloring. Um, so here are colorings. So this is a five coloring, for example, of this knot. So maybe let's do this one. Um, so whatever, red, green, orange, I guess, blue, and, and uh, purple. And this is the five coloring. And you, if you just give those things numbers, you can just check that locally around each crossing, they will satisfy the conditions. But this is kind of an annoying way of doing it, because now you think of you have a really large knot, whatever. Let me try to not draw a really large knot. Let me just try to draw a really large mess. OK, I call that a knot. Fine, it's really large. And now you're looking for a 13 coloring of this one. How would you do that? Um, just checking all possibilities this takes a bit of time. But that's not a good idea. So somehow we want uh, a nice way to do this. And the, the fun thing is, the colorings are really cool. There is an algorithm to do this. So you never need to think for a long time what to do. You can just run the algorithm and check. And the algorithm is so fantastic, it will answer the colorability questions for all numbers at once. So not just for one. It's not just you have one algorithm that you need to run for three, five, seven, whatever. But you have one general algorithm that solves it for all of them at once. Like, really remarkable. And it's a very strong knot environment, actually. OK, I hope the question is clear. How, how do we do this? Um, already, if you think about the trefoil itself, I mean, it, I feel like the trefoil is a bit, is, is kind of easy. I pulled up this picture again. Um, eventually, you would probably write down this coloring if I would ask you to do it. 
Like you only have three options essentially, so you eventually will write it down. But if you have a large mass, right, just a, a really, really large knot, let's go back to one of our tables. So how would you check, for example, where's my table, whether um, this knot here has a three color in it? A lot of crossings, a lot of arcs, a lot of segments. How would you do that, right? It doesn't seem to be completely trivial. Turns out it is essentially trivial, which is kind of very remarkable. Okay, back to where we were. Very good. Turns out you can use linear algebra to do this. So no, uh, yeah, and that's what we will do. It's, it's an extremely remarkable thing. You just write down the matrix and compute its determinant, and the determinant will tell you everything. It's really remarkable. Okay, so let me try to do this. All right. Um, so we had this one. Let me just pull it up again. What is the upshot before I show you how to do it with the algorithm? Well, the upshot are statements of this form, right? The trefoil is not the unknot. We had that one because it has a three coloring and the unknot doesn't. Good. So the unknot never has any interesting coloring because it's just one string, right? You can only color it monochromatically. Um, the trefoil is not equivalent to the figure eight knot because the figure eight knot is, has again no three coloring. Uh, so if you really want to do it, in, in this picture, the, I have red, green, and blue as my three colors, and there's no way to color the remaining strand. Right? So whatever I do, if I would say, let's say the remaining strand gets blue, oh, then I have a, pro oh, this, is, this is a really bad choice of blue. Here is blue, it gets blue, then I have a problem at this crossing, right? Because now it is whatever it is. And then let's say I wanted to make it red, then I have a problem at this crossing as well. So maybe, I need to put it green, but then I have a problem at this crossing. So there's just no way of doing it. Okay. So this is, again, not three colorable. It is five colorable. We'll see that in a second. Okay. And that, that's the kind of games we want to play. And now you can just put a knot, check for all colorings, and then you have an infinite number of invariants of that knot. And you can compare it to some other knot which, for which you have an infinite number of invariants. And they need to match everywhere for them to have a chance to be the same knot. So you have actually a good chance to, that they don't match everywhere, and you can say um, it's, it's a different knot. That's exactly the, the game we want to play. Good. So that's what we did, but we still can't decide, we will, we will in a second, we still can't decide whether those two are the same, because right now I only showed you the three coloring, right? And the P coloring will, will di distinguish them. So what I, again, what I think about the P coloring is the following. It's essentially a tuple you associate to um, no, 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 an infinite tuple that you associate to a, to a knot where every entry is yes or no, depending whether it has those number of colorings. So let's say you would do something like uh, three, four, five, six, whatever. Right, and then this one would get, for example, the top one would get uh, yes, and it is not coloring in any other form. So you can distinguish those, and here down here you would get a, this has a no, a no, and a yes, and whatever. So you can distinguish them because you have an infinite tuple of yeses and nos associated to your law. Hope that makes some sense. It's kind of a really strong thing. Good. Okay, and now I'll show you how it, how it goes. Um, so here's figure eight again. Kind of fun fact, there's only one knot with four crossings, so no matter how I draw it, it will always be this one. So I, I might draw it sometimes differently, um, but it's always the same knot. Um, anyway, so we consider the figure eight knot, and we label the sec segments in some traveling order. We start somewhere and label the segments C1, C2, C4. I will do that in a second. So let, let's say we start here. Let's say we go around in this direction. So this one is C1. And here's the next segment, C2. So segment really means you can go over crossings but not under. Yeah. So the next segment is a blue one, C3. And the next segment is this one, C4. Okay, you just label them, running around the knot. And the equation that you wrote down is the following. Um, this one needs to be, well, I just put, well, let, let's go back. I just have put one of them on the other side. Uh, let's go. Ooh. That, that was not good. Give me a, uh, that was wrong. Okay, 
here, of course. Um, where was my equation? Here. I just put the two of, on the other side, so I get 2ci minus cj minus ck should be congruent 0 mod p. Okay, back to my, to my matrix. So I just put them on the other side and then just travel along and read off uh, the conditions and I probably have labeled my strings now wrongly, so let's correct this one. So no, so C1, to go around the first crossing, okay, what do you see? You see C1 going over, C4 and C3 going under, so you get this equation. Right? At the next crossing, you see, um, so this is the orange one, it might be a relabeling issue, we'll see. So the next crossing, let's make it a blue crossing, C3 goes over, C2 goes under and C1 goes under. So this is this equation. Uh, we travel around the knot, we'll get this one. Uh, C2 goes over, C4 and C1 go under. So this is this equation. And one more to go. What is a good color? Purple. Purple. And this final one, what, which one goes over? C4 goes over and those two go under. All right, so you just write down the matrix. Just label the knots with, it, with some variables and just num number the matrix according to which one goes over, which one goes under. And we want this equation to be true. In other words, in matrix form, we can just solve for linear equation. I can just write down the matrix of coefficients. Hope that makes some sense. I think I have one more, so I have, yeah, very good. Uh, so I could just write down the matrix of coefficients here. Yeah? Yeah? And just put this one as a vector somewhere. And then I have an equation, a linear equation, matrix times vector should be zero, modulo p. It's exactly the coloring condition, but now phrased as a matrix. Does it make sense? I write down everything in terms of a system of equations. And the system of equations is linear, so I can associate to it a linear equation system with a matrix and a vector being congruent zero. And what comes out is exactly this statement that we need to, oh, this was really bad, that we need to uh, find the kernel of the matrix. We need to compute the solutions to the equation. And the solutions will be precisely the, the, P, the P coloring. Okay, so what have we done? I phrase it again. I've, we rephrased the whole problem in terms of a, a solved linear equation system type problem where you all know algorithms to do that. No? A computer can do it, for example. And this is just remarkable because we have an infinite number of invariants and we essentially know how to solve it because we only need to write down one matrix and look for, for its uh, solutions. That's essentially all we need to do. Hope that makes some sense. It's kind of a really remarkable idea. Cool. Huh? We reduced, well, oh, maybe I have a nice color here. Green is a horrible color, but anyway. Uh, right? We reduced finding colorings, or even counting colorings, to a linear algebra problem, which is somehow really much easier. It's just, a computer likes linear algebra problems, for example. Just solving linear equations. I hope that's, that's pretty nice. Okay, so what do we do? Let's do it again. You label the segments, you just keep on, um, I, I think, let's go back to this one. Uh, you label the segments, you just go around the knot, and each crossing, you just write down an equation, which strength goes over and which one goes under. You get an equation, and you get a matrix from that equation, and you just want to solve um, the matrix problem. What are the vectors in the kernel of the matrix? That's essentially the problem you want to solve. It's pretty simple. You just write down the knot, and you travel along, write down the system of equations, and you're good to go. And what do we get from here is an infinite number of invariants associated to a dot. Okay, so you might say at this point, okay, this is quite nice. You just write down a system of linear equations. Fine. It looks much better than just playing around on the knot trying to color it. Um, you just have an algorithm. You just solve the linear system of equations. But I still need to solve it very often for my coloring, but there's an even better way of doing it. Right now, I would need to solve this equation for every p, essentially. Right? So solve it again, solve it again, solve it again, solve it again. Um, but there's a better way of doing it, so you can solve it for all p at once, even. So 
instead of sitting down and trying to color your knot, um, everyone likes to do that, I guess. But anyway, it just for a large knot, this just takes forever. You just solve a linear system of equations, and you can do it in a way I haven't I haven't explained yet how to, but we'll see. And do it in a way such that you do it for all p at once. No, that makes some sense. So this is already good, but it gets even better. Okay. Okay, and the matrix I call the matrix the not matrix. So let me uh, also explain the matrix again. Um, it's exactly, so here's an example again. Um, so you can think of uh, a coloring, let's say again, you give every segment a label, C1, C2, C3, and the segment is, it goes exactly between, well, it, it's br it goes over crossings, but it will break it if we go, try to go under a crossing. So here I have three segments, C1, C2, and C3, right? The, the, the red one goes all the way over, so it goes over, over, whatever. The blue one is just here, the green one is just here. And I just look at, well, I write down a matrix, Okay, and I do it the following way. I just uh, look what goes over. Let's say have a look at this crossing here. So red goes over, so C1 goes over, so C1 gets a number two. Blue goes under, so C2 gets a minus one. Green is not involved, so this gets a zero. But then red goes under as well, so you need to get a, let me make it a space. So this one is a two minus one. Uh, this is hopefully my first, uh, what is it, row. Okay. We could do the same for blue um, and for uh, the other ones, blue and uh, uh, green. So for example, blue, blue never goes over and it only goes under at, at two different crossings. So let's have another look at another crossing here. So what would I write down for this crossing? I would write down, um, a two in the red column. So let me just make it. Let me just do it like this. A two for red, uh, uh, minus one for blue, and a minus one for green. Right? Minus one for blue, really minus one for green. So this is this column. So one more to go. Here, what would I write down? Well, red goes over, so I get a two. Red goes also under, so I get this one, and I get a minus one here and a zero. And now I give it just the colors to make this easier to see. Here you go, and here we go. And this should be hopefully the last column. Okay, and the matrix you get in this fashion is called the knot matrix. Doesn't make some sense. I write down the knot, I color, label the segments, and I just write down the equations that I want, and I put it into a matrix. And I call that one um, the knot matrix. Okay, hope that makes some sense. So I have a matrix associated to a knot, but that, that the matrix that's the matrix we want to, the matrix encoding our uh, linear equations. It's easy to get. Just look at the, well, use the projection, color the segments, and write down the equations from um, the segments. Which one goes over, gets a two, and the other ones get a minus one. Cool. Well, okay, I, I did it on the slide as well, but anyway. So the green crossing, gives the green row, the blue crossing gives the blue row, and the yellow crossing gives the, well, yellowish, orange type of rows. Right. Okay. okay, before I show you the answer, let me, um, it, it's a bit annoying to prove what I'm going to show you, but for a certain type of class of knots, the only knots that we'll ever consider, I guess, on questions are um, alternating knots. All right, so um, what, is it, what is it not called alternating? A knot is called alternating if it has a projection such that if you start somewhere, well, this one is boring, let's do this one first, and you travel around, the over and under crossings always alternate. Okay, if there's no crossing, then that's alternating because there's nothing. But here what I want is, what I really want is going over, so this is an over, going under, this is an under, and now I go over again, then I go under again, then I go over again, and then I go under again. Okay. Let's try this with the next knot. I hope that's really, really clear. You start somewhere, you travel around over, under, over, 
under, over, under, over, under. It's like, like you're living on the knot, you're traveling around, you go over a bridge, then do, through a tunnel, then over a bridge, then through a tunnel, then over a bridge, then through a tunnel. And such, such knots are called alternating. So here's a non-alternating knot. So this one is not alternating. Let me cross it out and then we'll see uh, why. Because here it goes over and over. Yeah, right? So here, this was bad. Those two, over and over. So you pass a bridge twice, and that's what we don't want. So this is not good. Uh, this one is fine. And here we would need to go around. Let me see. No, it's sadly not good. Here we would go twice through a tunnel. We were under and under. Okay. So this one is not good. Okay. Alternating is really just tunnel, bridge, tunnel, bridge, tunnel, bridge, and you walk around, and then tunnel and bridge. Turns out that alternating knots are like much easier than the rest, so we'll mostly focus on, on those guys. I hope the definition makes some sense. Okay, let me just write it out formally. A projection is alternating if the crossings alternate by tunnel bridge, tunnel bridge. Um, and it doesn't matter, you can go around in either direction, they will always alternate, but let's say we go in anti-clockwise direction. And so not projection is alternating, okay. and the knot is alternating if it has some knot projection. It's always a bit So not projection depends on, uh, so, uh, being alternating is not, not an invariant of the knot because it depends on the projection. Which, these guys, for example, are the same. Yeah, can, can you see this? If you take this string here and you just pull it down and then just untwink it, and then it's actually just the, the beats upstairs. So they're the same, but this one is alternating, and this one is not alternating. Being alternating is not a knot invariant. It's a property of the diagram you see. But it's an easy checkable property of that diagram. Does that make some sense? Okay, here's another example. I just did that for you because it's always fun to do this. So here's a, a non-alternating projection of uh, the, 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 the trivial knot. So let me show you that this is not alternating. Here, you have two bridges in a row. But it's actually, they, there are a lot of projections that are alternating, the final one, for example. And this is kind of a fun exercise how to do it. So it's just kind of really difficult to untangle uh, those knots. Just a warning, careful. Alternating is a property of a projection and not of a knot. Just be call a not alternating if it has some alternating projection. Right? So no, and not is alternating because it has a, some alternating projection, but not all projections are alternating. I hope that makes some sense. Right? It's a little bit similar to a graph is planar if there is a planar embedding, but not everything you draw needs to be planar. It's the same type of thing. No, nope, that makes some sense. Cool. I only did this because for, for an alternating knot, our little um, coloring problem has a, has a really nice solution. So you have an alternating projection of your knot. And our coloring problem has a very nice solution. You just color everything. Fine. So every segment goes under, over, under, over, under, over. So you can just color them uh, in a nice way. And you, what you will get is that every uh, row of our coloring matrix has exactly one, two, and two minus one somewhere. Not in one, not in one column, but sort of spread over the matrix. Okay. Here's an example. Okay, let's do this one. Um, so let's say green. Mm, mm, let's here, green goes over, red and blue go under. Let's just make a choice. Let's make this column, uh, let's make this column blue and this column, uh, what is it, red. So green goes over at the black crossing, so we write a two, a minus one and a minus one. Okay. And then I have a blue crossing, so blue goes over at the blue crossing 
and the other one goes go under. Sorry. So this is this is this guy. Very good. This is this guy. And then we have one more. Let's say the green one. The green one is this guy. So for the green one, red goes over, so red gets a two. The other one gets a minus one. And for an alternating knot, it will always look like this. So th th there is no clustering in some um, in some in some column. So here at the bottom, that's what I want to get. There's one two, and there are two minus ones in every row. One two and two minus ones. And you can check that if you want to do it. Uh, on the right hand projection. So we always get those nice knot matrices, which is one, two, and two minus ones per row. And every row corresponds to a crossing. Hope that makes some sense. Cool. Um, yeah, let me skip that lemma. Uh, and let me just, it's kind of annoying. Let me just give you a definition. Okay, let me a knot. And the not determinant is the following. The not determinant is the thing you want to compute. Um, and it's, it's the following. You write down the not matrix. Do I have a nice picture somewhere? Let me see. Nope. So let me just write down the not matrix here. Okay, you write down the not matrix. This is our not matrix. Okay. And you essentially want to take the determinant of that matrix, but because you travel around the not, the equations will have. Uh, one silly solution because this guy is not linearly independent, so the rows are not linearly independent. So you just do the following: you just kill, you cross out the first row and the first column, and you have a little bit of a smaller matrix, and you take the determinant of this matrix. Okay, so we'll do that in a second. For this one, what I would do: what is the not matrix of the trefoil? So what is the, uh, the determinant of the trefoil? That determinant of trefoil. Uh, 3, 1, the trefoil is 3, 1. Well, you get it as follows. You, you take this knot matrix, you cross out the first row and column, and consider the determinant of this guy, which is uh, 2 times 2 minus minus 1 times minus 1. So the determinant of the knot is 3. Right? It's, uh, maybe I should write it like 2 times 2 minus minus 1 times minus 1, because that's the determinant of my little 2 by 2 matrix here. And if you do the count, it will come out as three. Okay. Take the knot matrix, cross out first row and column, take the determinant of the remaining matrix. Cross out first row and column, take the determinant of the remaining matrix, and we call that one the knot determinant. And the knot determinant is an invariant. Okay, blah, 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 I skipped that one. The not determinant, and this is this, this notation. One, one just means cross out first row and column. Say it again. Take the knot matrix, cross out first row and column, take the determinant of whatever remains. That's a number, and it's called the not determinant. And up, because there's some choice involved how to order the knot, what you actually need to do is you need to take the absolute value of that one. So if you see a minus 5, it's 5. Take the absolute value. Really simple. It's actually really simple if you do that. You just write down the knot matrix, cross out first row and column, and take the determinant. Okay. Very good. Um, let's let's skip this one and let's go to the main theorem. It's very annoying playing. The proof is a bit annoying. So let me do this again. So um, the knot determinant is exactly this one. Cross out first row and column. And actually, if you really want to, that's what my little sentence on the, on the bottom right says. You, you can cross out every, anything you want. You need to cross out one row and one column. You could go for the third and the second or whatever. But let's just, let's just do one one. You could cross out all of them. And the theorem is, um, if you have an alternating knot, and that's why I wanted this, so we have an alternating projection, then the, the knot is p-colorable if and only if the prime divides the determinant. In particular, the prime factors of the determinant will tell you exactly the colorability of the knot. Just one calculation for all of them. So, for example, the determinant of our little trefoil friend, and let me just write 3, 1, that's a trefoil, is 3. So this knot is 
three colorable and only three colorable. It's not five colorable, five dozen divided three. It's not seven colorable, seven dozen divided three. It's not whatever colorable. It's only three colorable. So now a little answer. We now really get the yes, no, and then no, whatever, as our invariant. And you can just get it by computing one value. Right? Just again, one, one ring to rule them all. So you just need to compute one value, and you get divisible, you get the coloring question solved for all, for all p. You just look at the prime factors of the determinant. All right, I skipped proof. Proof is annoying. Just playing uh, with, um, with linear algebra. I don't want to do linear algebra. I'm not here to do linear algebra. Um, the right master moves. So the, 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 the matrix itself is not a not invariant. Because the right master moves will kill the rows and columns of that matrix, but the determinant is. Okay. Well, that's why I wanted to compute the determinant. So the determinant itself is uh, a not invariant, which kind of encodes all colorability in one go. So the determinant satisfies some the usual properties you would expect from a determinant. So the determinant of uh, a hash is just the product of the determinants. In particular, if, if the determinant of the hash is p, and it's a product of two things, then, then either k has p or l has uh, p, and the other one has 1. So there are knots that are, don't have any colorings at all. So you, you, could, you could hit not the determinant 1. Summary of how to do this, and then um, I show you the answer for the figure eight knot. So we label the segments in traveling order. From that, we get the knot matrix. The knot matrix is not really what we want. It's a tool to solve our problem. So don't focus on that one too much. So you cross out the first row and column, compute the determinant. That's the, num that's the number. You get some number, whatever, five, three, seven, 10, something, some number. And check whether your prime divides or check for the prime divisors of that number. So if we do that um, for our friend, which was still open, our little friend, uh, the figure eight knot, here's a knot matrix. Okay. So what we do is now this is a knot matrix. You cross out first row and first column. Look at this matrix and compute its determinant. It turns out that the determinant of our little friend K here is. Five. So there is a five coloring. There's no three coloring. There's a five coloring. There's no seven coloring. The only prime divisors of uh, maybe this is of this one here are five. Right? So the not determinant is five. So this one is five colorable and only five colorable. Hope it makes some sense. And you can do the same as an algorithm. You can do the same for every knot. You get some answer for your uh, color and problem, and you have just this, this huge number of uh, invariants associated to a knot just from uh, one calculation. So this one, so this is an example of a, of a five coloring. It only has four colors, but that's fine. Um, so this one is uh, five colorable, but not anything else. And the easiest way to check that um, is just to run this algorithm. Right? So let me say it again. You just write down the matrix. It's, a, it's kind of a combinatorial exercise. You do it twice, you do it three times, and it, it, it's fine, it's not difficult. You write down the matrix, you cross out first row and first column. That's also easy. You pick out whatever remains. That's also not difficult. You compute its determinant. It's annoying, but not difficult. Um, it's really annoying, but it's certainly not difficult. And whatever number comes out solves the coloring problem for all primes. For, for, sorry, for all, for all P's at once. There's one algorithm to just do the job for us. OK. Um, turned uh, problem into linear algebra. I hope that was uh, kind of enjoyable. And it's with, with everything you see, just do it twice, and it will be fine. So this one is actually uh, a really nice algorithm. It's quite powerful. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>